Okay, cool. So we start off where we left off this morning, and I promised you that I would give you a summary of this uh, alternative picture of calculating the zero mode um, spectrum in this local G2 compactification using this sort of super quantum mechanics point of view and Morse theory. Um, the reason why that's useful, and you know, you, you'll say, oh, well, we already calculated it in terms of the relative cohomology, if you remember uh, this expression here. Um, right, this, uh, the zero modes, which are basically uh, cohomologies with respect to this twisted differential curly D, which is D plus F wedge, can be rewritten in terms of the relative cohomology of M3, which is S3, uh, with respect to the negative boundary. So then you'll ask, okay, why are you now describing the alternative in terms of some quantum mechanics? The reason is that this will give a nice description of the Yukawa couplings. So this is one way of understanding now the, the matter spectrum, and then we can sort of get the Yukawa couplings in that picture uh, quite nicely as well which is from here not quite so clear. And since this is sort of uh, more of a uh, thing that follows up from what I was doing this morning, I've written it up and these slides will go online so you don't really need to take notes if you are so inclined to do. Anyway, um, so if you remember, the super quantum mechanics is formulated in terms of uh, interpreting D and D dagger in terms of the supersymmetries F is the superpotential, and the zero modes are the ground states, where now this twisted Laplacian is the Hamiltonian. And close to a critical point, where we have essentially F such that DF is zero at that point, and let's say that point is zero, is actually a pointer where I can point to with this. Oh, it's a different thing. I will start writing in a moment. It's just that for now, this is quite useful to. Excellent. So close to a critical point where F has basically the expansion constant plus quadratic pieces, um, this twisted Laplacian takes this form here. Right? This was the general expression just specialized to this expansion here. And we're now making the assumption that the critical loci of this are actually isolated points on M3. So functions of this type are called Morse functions. If they're not, then they're Morse bot functions. And that's a case that will become important as well. Okay. And then where we left it off in the morning is that now each critical um, point has a Morse index, which is just the number of eigenvalues of the Hessian, which are negative. So, for example, here we have one minus and one plus. And in the case of this three manifold Morse uh, function business, there are two cases. One is Morse index one, so the signs are minus plus plus, and Morse index two, which is minus minus plus. And they correspond to the one forms and the two forms. And taking this um, uh, Laplacian here, this twisted Laplacian computing now, the zero modes for this, uh, the one forms I can write in terms of just some exponential, right? It's like a harmonic oscillator close to uh, this critical point and times one form, and the two form ones again have this sort of e to minus x squared, the x1 wedge, the x2. Where these guys here in out front, they are just basically um, specifying a spinner and all the right quantum numbers for the four dimensional transformation. They also have basically indicate that there's a charge Q dependence and this is for the point P, which is a critical point with this particular Morse index. So this was roughly where we were. And now there's sort of a story, uh, well, this is actually just a perturbative result. Um, so there are actually corrections to this in the super quantum mechanics, namely there can be instantons they connect two of these vacua. So imagine you have a critical point PA, another critical point PB, Morse index mu A, mu B, 
And then it's possible that actually there's a mass term which really descends from the 70 super young mills interaction term of this type. There's a mass term that's generated by looking at sort of the instanton corrections to here, which I will now construct morally speaking for you. So this mass term in terms of this quantum mechanics is just expectation value of this uh, D operator, the supercharge between two states, psi and psi A and psi B that are located at these critical points, P A and P B. And then this path integral actually localizes and becomes a, basically a path integral where you sort of the, the, the fields are paths that join from P A to P B and the super partners with a Euclidean action, which is just a sigma model into this three manifold M3. So this is a, quite a classic story. I gave you a reference for this um, earlier this morning. So I'm not going to, uh, it's, it's a, it's a Witten's um, Morse function and quantum mechanics or in this hoary mirror symmetry book where you can find a nice derivation of this. Uh, basically the key is that this integrand is now Q exact from the point of view of the super quantum mechanics. And so in fact it localizes on Q fixed points what are these Q fixed points? You look at the SUSY variations, and they're actually given in terms of exactly uh, paths gamma, which are gradient flows from PA to PB. So these paths have boundary conditions. They start at PA and go to PB. And so this localizes onto these uh, gradient flows. And then this mass term actually is now a sum over all these gradient flows from these two points from PA to PB with a sign that basically depends on the orientation of these paths and then with this weight factor here. And in the geometry, how you should think about it in this ALE geometry is there's now a gradient flow between PA and PB and above it, right, this was a critical point of this function F of our zero of the Higgs field and critical point of the Morse function. So here, this ALE fibers collapsed, and then as we move out, it sort of spans these are two spheres, and as we look at, follow this along this gradient flow trajectory, it actually sweeps out a three-sphere. And now the question is, is that three-sphere supersymmetric? Right? Is there actually a contribution um, to, uh, is there actually non zero contribution to this? This is exactly the condition that this is actually a supersymmetric cycle, an associative cycle, if this path gamma is a gradient flow line. Okay, and so now, of course, there can be cancellations. So just because there is such a gradient flow doesn't mean that this is automatically, they're not a zero mode, but actually there could be for plus and minus cancellations here. And how do we actually see in M theory that these instantons contribute while well, you wrap and two brains on these three spheres, and they can now uh, give uh, potentially uh, superpotential contributions. And again, the same sign in gamma appears there. Lo and behold, once we follow through this analysis and look at you know, what kind of zero modes come out of this, quantum mechanics plus these instanton corrections, this just reproduces what we already know, namely that it's the relative cohomology of M3 with respect to this sigma minus. So this is just something to, and the reason why this is sort of a nice way to look at it is because now we can also construct, this picture is really not, can't really draw it much better, but use your imagination. Uh, if you now actually think in terms of um, Yukawa couplings, right? So at each of these points, these are critical points of this Morse function, um, you have localized matter. And now if you can find a gradient flow tree that connects these t two or three um, uh, points, critical points, then again following the two sphere nail E fiber between these, right, this sort of goes into the middle and joins up. Um, so here we need actually two Morse functions, right, some charge for U1 and U2. And then I'm combined a Morse function that's a linear combination of these two things. Basically, again, the criterion for getting a Yukawa coupling here is that, that cycle here that I'm constructing as the ALE fiber over this tree uh, is actually a supersymmetric cycle if this is actually gradient flow. Okay, so this is how one gets the Yukawa couplings. So, but I promised 
two other things that I would do in these lectures, and since we are somewhat running late, I need to get... Yes, the question? No, you can ask it. Hmm? And now we have it here, so you can ask it now. So I promised you to also say something about these more recent developments. Um, so uh, that has to do with building not just ALE vibrations of the three manifolds of the local G2s, but um, compact G2 manifolds, and why there's been sort of some resurgence in the interest in these things. So. Um, Let me just uh, spend some time now uh, explaining what we know about these gadgets. And you should always contrast this to what we know about Calabiao manifolds and these enormous databases that we have there. Okay, so um, the first class of really compact G2 manifolds, so the compact examples, Um, were of the type T7 mod gamma, which are uh, the so-called Joyce orbifolds. Um, so gamma is engineered such that it preserves a G2 form. And then the tricky part in this is to actually find a resolution that makes it G2. And actually, uh, Tuan had a nice question yesterday uh, about, so when you do these resolutions, you know, I'm always worried about whether you, this is something that's unique or not. So in this K3 case, it's basically one way of doing this, right? So I showed you how you resolve this C2 mod gamma thing. Um, for Calabiaos, there can be these singularities, and often when you can resolve it, there are various paths of resolving them, and they're sort of... Um, you can think of them as when you put m theory on it, it's like moving, when you do transitions, you blow it down a cycle, blow it up in a different way, that's like the slop transitions, they're like moving in the Coulomb band of say a gauge theory in three dimensions and five dimensions. And, for G and, and there are very well-defined algebraic methods how you do these resolutions in Calabiaos. You check algebraically how does it transform the canonical class and is it still rigid flat after you've done the procedure? Um, for G2s, it's literally, you extract where the singularity is and then you try to put something in there and you go case by case. And this is basically what Joyce did and if you look into his book, that's sort of literally the me mechanism. And um, there are many, many ways of resolving these um, uh, orbifolds. I think hundreds for the simplest one. Uh, but it's certainly not as a machinery uh, that's readily available as it is for Columbia House. So it's much more hands-on uh, figuring it out case by case. Okay, that's just a comment about that. Um, right, so the tricky part here is resolve singularities um, while keeping achieve flatness. Um, these are nice examples because you can think of them as like, you know, you could do type two strings. You can get a world G description in terms of orbifolds. And so think of them as like some orbifold constructions of Calabiaos. So you can do something like this for um, G2s as well. And one thing to note is there's not a classification of these kinds of orbifolds. So the story goes that uh, Joyce sort of did a couple of them and he got bored, he went for T and never thought about it again. So that's basically, there's lots of examples that you can still construct here. But they're not the most exciting uh, manifolds. Why we are sort of, in, there's a second class I should mention, Calabria 3 times S1 with omega, where omega is an anti-holomorphic involution. And there are certainly examples uh, there that people have studied. Uh, the reason why um, there's been a recent 
resurgent is a, a different one. It's coming from uh, these what's called twisted connected sums. And there's a, if you not thinking day in, day out about Calabiaos and G2s, you can think of them as the following field theoretic construction. So you know very well, you know, you, you, if you put some M theory on a Calabiao threefold, you get a five dimensional n equals one theory. So in fact, if you put it on M theory and Calabiao three times S1, you get a four dimensional n equals two theory. And so this twisted connected sum is basically saying, I take two of these, Calabiao, another Calabiao, so they give me n equals two, four, four dimensional n equals two theories, and now I'm gauging an n equals one multiplet. That's basically what these are. So the TCS, so they are the TCS, so field theoretically, Take two Calabiao three times S1, so called building blocks, which give you 4D n equals two theories, and gauge with n equals to one vector multiplet. So it's a very mildly n equals to one theory. And we'll see that also in the spectrum of these models. So uh, geometrically, What's going on is, so this is sort of very briefly filled theoretically how you should think about them. So we, we, we have to start with two building blocks, which are, I'll denote them Z plus minus, and there are some K plus minus phi bad over P1, and the K plus minus are K3s, the K3 surfaces, and the fiber over P1. Now, you can fiber this such that then Z plus minus are color BRs, but we don't want to do that. So we want to actually fiber them such that C1 of Z plus minus is actually the class of a fiber, this K3. It's not Ritchie flat. And now what we can do is we'll take out a point from the P1 and the fiber above it. So we take out essentially a K3, and then this space now is actually, right, because now we are removing a K3 class, so actually the resulting thing is then a, a Calabi R3 that now has a boundary, it's asymptotically cylindrical, um, and that will be what we use for building block. So let me go to the next page. So now we move. Fiber. So we basically now define x plus minus as again the same k3 plus minus vibration over now p1 plus minus minus a point. And these are now going to remove the fiber. So that's right. the initial vibration was exactly such that this is now the G flat. Okay, and so these type of things we can construct on mass algebraically. So you can, these things are readily constructible using toric methods, like toric tops or, um, you know, uh, Cordy et al. Uh, had some other methods uh, uh, to actually, from Fano, three folds to construct these things. Okay, and so these are bit too flat, and actually what's called, um, they are asymptotically. And why the asymptotic is cylindrical, Calabiao, well the base, P1 plus minus, minus a point, is basically C. You know? It's like a disk. And so asymptotically, these become something like R plus times S1 plus minus, oh, sorry, so. This is 
sort of P1 uh, times uh, the K3 fiber. Yeah, so this is asymptotically close to this boundary where you take the sphere and you take out a point. Okay, that didn't work. Anyway, you know how to take out a point from a sphere, so I don't need to draw that, I think. Um, punch a hole in it. So why is this now a nice thing to do? Well, we can take two of these and have them asymptote to the same K3 times cylinder, so region, and then glue them together. Okay, so now this PCS construction is basically um, we have sort of a K3, take two of these X plus minus, glued together along the same asymptotic region. And now we have to do a little bit more. If we did that, then we just get a Calabiao back. That would be really stupid. It wouldn't be actually a G2. So we need to modify the construction a little bit. Namely, we take x plus minus times circles and then uh, do the following exchange. So I'll show you the picture because drawing this will be a real pain. So here's the picture. Ignore the thing at the bottom for the moment. Um, so just think in terms of the top. So these are our K3s, right? The two K3 surfaces. They're fibered over the P1s, and I've already taken out a point. So these are these basically C plus minuses here and here. And now I take a product with a circle, and the TCS construction is you take the asymptotic region to be this circle here times that circle here times this interval times the K3. So the asymptotic behavior of this K3 surface needs to agree with that one here, but actually gluing them with what's called a hypercalar rotation. And I'll write that down in a second. So we're gluing, so X plus minus, by exchanging the circles, so this is this part here. And a hypercalar rotation. So what is a hypercalar rotation? Well, we discussed that K3s have three of these uh, uh, omega i complex structures or Kähler forms. So we had omega 1 plus i omega 2, which make up a 2,0 form, a complex one, and omega 3, which is, let's say, 1. This is omega 1, 1. And now what we have this for base of the building blocks. And in order to get actually G2, in order to got G2 manifold, we need to destroy this structure a little bit, so we need to mix these up. So in fact, the hypercalar rotation is identify omega 1 plus minus with omega 3 minus plus and omega 2 plus minus with minus omega 2 minus plus. Okay. And so... Although you're gluing essentially a K3 surface to another K3 surface, you are mixing up sort of the, the, the hypercalar structures of these. And the theorem that was proven by um, Cordy, Haskin, Nordstrom, Passini, I gave the reference in my first lecture, was that the resulting concoction is actually, or admits, a G2 holonomy metric. So the resulting Manifold admits a G2 holonomy metric where this metric actually asymptotes the Ritchie flat Calabial's reinforced metrics of the building blocks in the limit when you take this neck region to be uh, infinitely long. Okay, so one way you can think of this is right from if you really decouple these completely, you get an n equals two sector and n equals two sector in the middle. You have a K3 times essentially T2 times interval or R 
compactifications in the middle you actually get n equals 4 subangles and n equals 2 decoupled sectors. As you bring them in at finite distance on um, this n equals 4, only an n equals 2 vector multiplet is actually massless. And that's then coupling these two n equals 2 theories together. But this is very special, right? This is your, not your generic n equals to 1 theory. So um, indeed, what we'll discuss in the remainder is that these manifolds are very special. And what I drew for you below um, is exactly what we discussed today and yes, uh, yesterday, sort of in the second lectures. What is actually the local model of this geometry? Okay, and uh, this sorry. is. Sorry? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what is plus minus? In the so these are the two building blocks. You have one building block, a Calabiao 3, oh, I see. Sorry. and yeah, another yeah, Calabiao, right? right? There are two Calabiaos, yeah, yeah, two yeah. n equals two theories from M theory. And they are asymptotically cylindrical, because I have taken out uh, sort of this fiber, so these guys are actually Calabiaos, but they have a boundary and they are asymptote 2k3 times this cylinder. And they come from plus and from minus. Uh, yes, another question, no. which is actually a question. Um, can you also do something S and just in exchanging the two cycles? Can you do an SL2Z? Sorry? Can you do an SL2Z identification uh, instead of, of exchanging just the two S1? Ah, here. Yes, so maybe you, with there a are something that's called extra twisted connected sums? And you would hope that, right, so the goal would be you get a G2 manifold that has a conical seven, quarter dimension 7 singularity. None of these things actually do that. So you can do a little bit more how you glue this. Basically, you're gluing now, and I haven't told you this, but the whole thing actually boils down to be a K3 fibration over S3, which is glued together from two solid tori. And the solid tori are exactly, basically, if you think of this is a circle, this is a circle, this is like R, so you have a solid torus uh, times another solid torus, but they glue together in a particular way to then generate an S3. Um, there are some modifications there. Um, I'm not sure it's really a full SL2Z that you have there. Um, but yeah, there are some generalizations, but none of them actually will give you the right thing that you want. How, but I will tell you what you have to do, so bear with me. Um, from this local picture. Okay, so, um, yes, I should mention, uh, right, so the, the, these TCS have globally the structure of a K3, uh, let's call them J over S3. Um, when S3 glued from the solid tori of the building blocks. And actually, the K3 is SUSI, i.e., is a, what's called a co associative. So this is actually a compact version of the stuff that we've been constructing all along, right? We were constructing ALE vibrations over S3, and now we have a global construction. And so then it's not interesting to ask, so how does the Higgs bundle, or this Higgins system that we wrote down earlier in these lectures, how does the Higgs bundle for this Compact geometry. There's a question about the Higgs bundle. So the Higgs bundle is this object we've been okay. Phi and this this BPS equations. Commutator phi phi minus F W is zero. D phi D dagger phi is zero. This object, the vibration phi and W together you can call it Higgs bundle, because phi is like a Higgs field, it Higgs some higher gauge group to a lower rank one, and so math they would call that. Is that 
Hmm? Not really, but... So, um, how does this now right, look in this local geometry? And I, I haven't maybe said this often enough, but constructing compact geometries of G2 with G2 holonomy uh, with co-dimension seven singularities that give chiral matter is up to this point an open question in mathematics. So no one has done this. Non-compact geometries, sure, but compact ones, that's an outstanding question. Um, one of the questions is then, given that in, with this TCS construction, we seem to have a huge number of examples now of compact geometries. So I think they go into the now millions, I was told. Uh, you can really ask now, is there actually something there that's useful or is close to the types of models that we would like to have? And we've characterized the models that we'd like to have in terms of this Higgs bundle, yes? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, repeat it, please. Cause I also is, is this the only K3 vibration which the space admits? So is it always that the gauge singularities are then localized along the base? Yeah, this because this is base? really global. This and the, So this, this is the only locus uh, where these appear? Or could there I mean, there are, other other, as, there are other three spheres, of course, right? So uh, you can construct in these uh, G2 manifolds or other three spheres. Uh, but I don't think that they normally would admit any non abelian singularities above it. Yeah, I haven't thought about this, but I don't think, obviously. I mean, this is certainly the natural one. The space doesn't have any... It, it, all the math literature papers would have no singularities at all. <laughs> so already by con the constructions that with, with Andreas Brown of constructing some building blocks, so the idea is, of course, the building blocks can now be some calabiaos with singular K3 fibers and now glue them together. And as a physicist, say, well, this is close enough. You can take a singular limit like this or you can glue it afterwards. It shouldn't really make a difference. For a mathematician, it's still one step ahead, right? So when you do that construction, you get a non abelian gauge uh, symmetry and matter, but the matter is not of the type that we want, and I want to explain this sort of in a, in a moment. Okay, so what is the local model? Um, well, so essentially uh, the, so this uh, phi field uh, has one dimensional critical loci, so I want to maybe I will show this here. So here the um, the yellow or the critical uh, loci of the of phi in this model. And the way to think about this is that uh, you can write down a Higgs bond for this uh, K3 fi or A leaf vibration over P1, which is a Calabial. It's non-compact, it's not important. And then essentially you get point-like singular, point-like uh, um, localized matter. So at these points here, these are the critical loci for the X field for this Calabial. So we can run the same story what we've done for the G2 in the Calabial case. And these red points and the blue points are the charge configurations in that case. And However, since we're taking a product with, cir with a circle, the actual critical loci are now circles. They're one-dimensional. So this is the case that's actually not covered in terms of a Morse function, but in this case, we need a Morse bot function. Um, the charge configurations are then also circles, and the same happens here. And the way the gluing works with this sort of exchange of these circles is actually that these are interlinked in this way. But now, you know, I didn't, I only discussed this uh, uh, case with the um, 
Moore's functions, but there's sort of a similar story for these one-dimensional one critical loci. So generalization of the Moore's um, using what's called Moore's bond functions. You know, that actually here the Kyle index is always zero, irrespective of what you do. So this comes basically from the fact that we are looking at something that's actually almost like an n equals two theory. So this is, um, and, and this sort of doesn't change, and this is quite, this is robust towards uh, small deformations, namely, right, so these charge configurations that we had, there were sort of concentric circles, for example. Um, and then uh, the critical loci were somewhere here. Right, so this is when the F is equal to zero. And this is the charge. This is what we call sigma minus. And if I do a small deformation, can, um, right, if I now take these two wires and I deform them a little bit into ellipses, then the critical loci are not any more one dimensional, but you will still get a sort of critical loci of so if there's a more, same number of, of Morse index one and two, and they'll just cancel in the same way. So some uh, information can um, uh, give one-dimensional, a zero-dimensional um, critical points, but still the chiral index. Um, unchanged. And this is not surprising because we know that this is sort of, the, this chiral index is only sensitive to a very specific combination of where these degenerations of the, where these singular K3 uh, fibers are located. So let me get this expression out again that we wrote down, uh, I think, this morning. So, so the chiral index oops, was g given, so B1, first of all, was with respect to sigma minus, it's just L plus plus N minus, minus R minus 1, and B2. Right, which were the number of plus and minus charged loops, the number of components, and the number of relative components of plus and minus charged loops. And so um, the chiral index is then just n plus minus L plus minus n minus minus L minus. So as long as in these TCS geometries we're moving along, so if we're doing deformations of these um, uh, charge configurations, which is exactly loci uh, so that I drew, these are the circular loci, uh, where these number of loops and interlinking numbers are unchanged, the chiral index will not change, right? So the only way, right, starting with something that looked like this, to actually get something that where the chiral index changes, for example, if you actually have some sort of singular transition where you uh, merge, say, two of these loops, and then sort of restructure them in terms of, say, one, it's now you get one extra component, but you have uh, more loops. So, so you have one less component, right, but you have the same number of loops. So some transition like this here is now very clearly not in this class of geometries that are of this type, right, because here, 
because of the structure of the type of product with circles on each side, you always get interlinking circles as the critical loci. So in fact, uh, this would sort of take you out of the realm of these TCS geometries. But basically, this would be a singular transition. in these TCS, G2s um, away from these. And so the, the, if you do such a transition this, in the local model, there's no problem doing that, obviously, but um, if you try to then re-uplift it to a TCS type construction, the right-hand side will not be in that class of models. And so, of course, there's you know, no compact uplift, but this is something that one needs to do in order to get something that actually has, uh, say, some chiral spectrum. Okay, so another way of stating that these um, twisted connected sums are actually extremely special is, uh, so uh, some of these TCS are very special, and this is sort of special in an odd a good sense. I mean, they're too special. <laughs> they're very special G2s. Um, another way of saying this is that you can take, we discussed this too, is to apply um, M-theory heterotic duality. And if one does this, so then these TCS actually all map. So if we have K3 fibers that are elliptic, um, then the heterotic T3 over S3, Calabial threefold, is just um, the so called Schön Calabial which is Betty numbers 1919, uh, with varying uh, vector bundle. So all of these geometries, or a sub, big subclass of these geometries, just map to one heterotic geometry, and then you can pick different vector bundles. But that's a very special class then. Still, so that's a very useful class because it gives you a compact set of yes, uh, manifold. Mostly, or all of them are elliptic, like in the Calabi case. Or no, that's not true. No, it's just in that case you can track through the duality. Sure, uh, but yeah. it's not no, I don't think so. I mean, okay, I'm not going to answer this question because I don't know what it means to be most of them. Not you mean in the in the class of things that people have exactly. constructed? I don't think that's the case. Actually, I don't know. I should ask these uh, Mark and so on. Certainly, the way we constructed them with these toric embeddings, then yes, it's very natural to do that, but it's not a necessity, I think. But then this is not a, you know, it's not a complete list or anything. So I think the statement's probably not uh, so useful. Okay, so this is what we know about um, the compact uh, realm of things. So mathematicians are at this point studying exactly how can one move away from this. So in fact, uh, the little bit sort of one step behind is studying at the moment deformations in this light blue type where you, you, you have some sort of standard TCS type, the critical loci, and then you do small deformations that don't break the TCSness of this. You can still decouple these two sectors. Um, so it's still quite far to then construct something that really would realize a compact uplift of some transition that I sort of sketched for you here. But in a local model, no problem. Cool. So since I have about 15 minutes left, um, I wanted to sort of give some uh, summary of things that I think are interesting to look at in this a set of questions. Um, we, don't, we didn't get to looking at the brains in the setup, uh, but there's certainly also some interesting uh, questions there, so maybe I will 
uh, sort of make a summary of those developments as we go along and also tell you now where actually are things that are still uh, open issues uh, that are not on the level of uh, study the Sobolev spaces uh, that uh, one needs to study in order to prove that certain G2 metrics uh, exist. Yes, so, but actually physical um, questions. So, so in this uh, local, so ALE, vibration, or ADE uh, construction of non-compact <coughs> G2s using 70s super young mills, uh, there was a very, very important specialization that we've made. We specialized to phi always being uh, an abelian Higgs field. Yeah, so remember, phi was a section of omega 1 on M3 valued in some bundle P, and this was basically some. Um, principal bundle in G perp, where G was broken to G perp times G. Right? So some higher rank gauge group is Higgs to the actual physical gauge group G, and G perp was where phi lived. And for us, G perp was always U1, or some power of u one. The reason is that it's not really known how to compute the cohomologies, um, these uh, the zero modes, uh, were computed by H star with this D operator on M3 with P and D is D plus um, the F wedge, where the F was phi. And this cohomology for not a U1, or a product of U1s, just don't know how to evaluate that. So I think that's a, an interesting question to generalize this. Of course, this also then ties in with having more interesting Higgs bundles, like, for example, T-brain-like constructions. Okay, so how to compute the spectrum for phi in some generic, not necessarily a billion, Then, um, in this uh, super quantum mechanics picture, right? So we've we've argued that this um, the um, the cohomology p arises from the instanton corrected Morse cohomology. Um, what, and there's a nice uh, quantum mechanical picture for this. Um, what is the SQM description for the interactions? I.e., when I drew this sort of, you know, trivalent uh, graph where you have um, these three critical loci being uh, con con connected through a uh, gradient flow tree, there's no nice quantum mechanical picture that I know to describe this. There's sort of a way to think about this in terms of the ALE fiber over this gradient flow tree and that that's a supersymmetric cycle, but in the super quantum mechanics, um, what actually, how can I sort of directly calculate this? It would certainly be a very nice uh, question to answer. 
Okay, so these are sort of very directly connected to the things that we discussed. Um, a bit more broader, uh, things sort of slightly uh, wider, it is that, of course, uh, there's the questions uh, related to uh, brains, so we didn't, we, we didn't discuss brains and five brains in G2, compactifications. So for this, remember we had calibration forms, phi 3 and the four form star phi 3. So these calibrate cycles, right, so these are volume minimizing in a given homology class. So psi or whatever phi restricted to any, at any point down to space M3 is the volume of TPM for all P and M. So M is a three cycle here. And likewise, star phi for M is a four cycle. These are called associative and co-associative. Three and four cycles in G2. So there are analogs of curves in Calabi-Aus or special Lagrangian cycles in Calabi-Aus. Uh, so they're calibrated. I mean, you wrap a brain on it. It'll preserve supersymmetry because uh, the volume minimizing property is exactly sort of telling you that it will satisfy the BPS bound, this object. So now we can ask, well, uh, consider, for example, uh, M5 on some three cycle or M5 on some four cycle of this type. What type of theories do I get if I compactify uh, the M5 brain on such a, a three cycle that's embedded into G2? Um, and so again, to, to study this, you can look at um, a curved three cycle. For this, you have to do a topological twist. So uh, the normal bundle of M3 in a G2 is given by it's a spin bundle, tensor rank to vector bundle. And in fact, this is something that comes out also by looking at just the topological twist, that there will be fields that are now sections of this normal bundle. But I actually still have a couple of minutes to do that. So just very briefly, right, so you, so you can see this also by looking at um, our so doing a standard topological twist decomposition. So in this case, one has to do the decomposition of the R symmetry in terms of SU2 times SU2. Um, right, so this is Lorentz, this is R symmetry, let's call this R and L, and then twisting, say this here with that, like we did, I think, yesterday in the second lecture, um, doing sort of similar analysis, then shows, uh, this gives actually a theory that preserves um, one super, so N equals one supersymmetry in three dimensions. So the supercharges um, four bar four of the sixty two comma zero theory then just become the following fields. Let me just write them down to two plus and so this is and um, right so these are uh, this is the SO one comma two L representation here actually 
and sorry for the change of ordering. And then the twist then will happen in the back. So we get an N equals one theory, but we also uh, see that if you apply the same to the fermions, so the, to the fermions and they say I'll be intensive multiplied, uh, the fields uh, here, this two, 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 will actually be a, what's called a bi-spinner field. And that's exactly a section of the spin bundle. So actually the theory uh, at the end of the day is an N equals to one theory in three dimensions. So it's two super supercharges, uh, which is a sort of a different realization of a theory um, based on a three cycle that you might know, which is this class R theory where you embed M3 in terms of a special Lagrangian cycle in Calabria. Okay, so this is contrasted to M3, a special Lagrangian cycle in Calabria R3, which gives a 3D N equals to 2. And these are these class R or DGG theories. Cool. So that in this way, um, you can now think in terms of, say, you have M theory, you compactify on the G2 manifold, you have a four dimension equals one theory, then these guys here, these M5 brains wrapped on three cycles, then I give domain walls in these four dimensional theories, right? So one way of uh, thinking about these is, these are like domain walls in the 4D N equals to one. And that's also one a nice application. So one question that sort of is uh, interesting to look into here is take so study uh, domain walls in G2 compactifications. And that might also be interesting in the light of recent developments on 3D N equals 1 theories. And then finally, there's also M5s on M4, co-associative uh, four cycles. And doing a similar sort of topological twist, the resulting two-dimensional theories are chiral 0, 0,2 theories. And there's been sort of a match of this with um, the, the elliptic genus of these are, for example, given in terms of Rafa written partition functions on the four manifolds, uh, as an example. So, there are interesting applications. So, here, uh, sort of, um, uh, Gade Gukov Putrov made a claim that the elliptic genus of the, this, 2D theory is equal to the Waffer Witten partition function on M4. So, Waffer Witten partition function is a particular twist of N equals 4 subyang mills, and uh, the claim is that this actually uh, is reproducing that. Okay, um, good. So, I think I should probably have two more minutes, but I don't think it's. Hiroshi is getting sort of started in five minutes. Uh, maybe I will stop and you can ask que some questions now or later or whatever. I mean, you can. Yes? You have a question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so you have described this um, a sort of cutting and gluing procedure mm -hmm. to construct uh, these G2 manifolds. So, and even the, the gluing has an interpretation as gauging in the mm -hmm. 4D series. So this is very, uh, I mean, it makes me think of the usual uh, procedure in class S series. Yes. So it's actually like N equals one class S. Yes, yeah, so there, this was a question. I mean, mm -hmm. one, one sort of obvious question is can you generalize this and gluing uh, more yes. pieces? 
Can you think I about the trinion uh, theory? Yes, <laughs> yes uh. I've, I've been there. It's a very good question. Um, indeed, that would be natural because that might give you a nice class of things to play with. Certainly not in this compact setup, right? Uh, because that's very rigid. You need this asymptotic region and there are just two things and you need to glue them in this way. And these are very difficult theorems to prove that then there's a G2 metric. I think in a non-compact case, you might be able to make some more progress there, but I, I don't think anyone has looked into this. Yes. So here, the gauge theoretic interpretation is literally you're just gauging this n equals to 1, and that sort of couples these two n equals to 2 sectors. In the decoupling, you have sort of these two sectors decoupled plus an n equals 4, but that, that doesn't talk to these. But it seems weird that this does not generalize, no? I agree. So I think there is a way to think about it which is just forget about the G2 construction and just do this kind of gauging. We have a trinion and then you gauge an n equals to 1 vector multiplane. That's, I think, n equals 1 class S construction. Um, so it's very reminiscent of that. Uh, it would be interesting to indeed see how you would do G2 in a more general setting like that. But so far I haven't been able to do, sort of see that. That's a good question. Any other questions about G2? Maybe we all have the questions. You Indeed, have a question? we, we will have more questions yeah, in the later, in the discussion later. session. And for now, let's thank Sakura again for her nice four lectures and four ways. Thank you.